Recording in progress. Praise the Lord. So I want to talk to you this morning about a form of godliness. Timothy talks about that, and I, I already know I'm not going to get all the way into my message, and this will probably take at least maybe two more Sundays to preach. But I need to get started on it, don't I? So Amen. Best time to start is right yeah. now. Amen. We read in the Bible the phrase last days. You've heard that term used over and over. It's amazing that we look back over time. I know that my mom and dad, <clears throat> there was a church that they were involved with down in San Antonio, Texas when we lived there. And uh, they told me a story about the, I think it was mobile, the gas station. Some of y'all may remember, and every now and then you see, still see it. Remember the horse with the wings on it? And they put that up on their gas stations, and people freaked out. Believers did, at least. Some believers, not all. They thought that was a sign of the Antichrist or something. The end of the world was coming because a horse with wings was on a gas station. Each generation has thought that the Lord is going to return in their time, have they not? Yes. I believe he's going to return in my time. <laughs> but everybody before me has thought the same thing. He may, he may not. We don't know. But we know that God has a plan. In our time, it's looking like we're getting a little bit closer, though, doesn't it? I know this, and I can say this with a certainty, that we are closer today to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ than we were yesterday. Would you agree with me on that? Amen. I know that he's got it under control. I know the Father's going to say, Jesus, go get my children. In the second coming, we will be ushered into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. And it's going to be an awesome thing. You know, the word talks about during the millennial reign of Christ to live a thousand years to be blessed. For those that don't, that are not believers now, but are going to be in the kingdom. There's going to be people in the kingdom in that regard. And it says to live a hundred years is to not be blessed. Think about that. To live today a hundred years. You know, the Lord's given us how many years? Trick question. 120, John. <laughs> 120 years. You still got a long way to go, brother. Here. I fell last week, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 120 years. 70 years was for those that were in Israel. If you read the, the text there in Psalms, Moses is, is talking about those that fell in the, in the desert and what have you. Um, they all fell with the exception of the children that grew up into that generation. And they were the ones that went into the land. But... We have 120 years. I've had people tell me before that I don't want to live 120 years. I'll tell you what. I want to live 120 years plus. And I want to be just like Abraham. I want to be like Moses. I want to be like all our patriarchs before that they just laid down and said, hey, I'm giving up the ghost. Basically saying, Lord, I'm going to see you on the other side. Amen. I have a new goal now. You have a new goal. Yeah, it's not 70 plus. It's uh, 120 now. 120, <laughs> praise the Lord. So Sandy and I, on the 3rd, which was Friday, we made a trip down to Hops, New Mexico. That was our anniversary. We have been together 35 years. Married 32 years. We dated for three years, and then finally after three years, we're like, we need to just get married. She's like, I've been waiting for you to say that. So, <laughs> praise the Lord. So we got married. We've been married for 32 years this last Friday. And we had a wonderful time. Thank you. We went down and we got some chairs. I'm going to share this and I'm going to get into my message. As you know, Pastor always has squirrels. <laughs> we got blessed. I was wanting some more chairs for in here and not have to use our fellowship hall chairs. And I wanted some blue ones. And so I got online. I found these blue chairs down in Hops. They were $20 each, which I thought was a really good price for padded chairs. And they're in good shape. And so... The lady told me, said, well, if you buy more than 20, then we'll give them to you for 15 each. I'm like, all right, praise God. And she was a believer, by the way. It was, we had a great time just being with her while we were loading up and stuff. And before we got out of there, we got them all strapped. She rang up the price and let us have them for $10 each, praise the Lord. What a blessing, amen. What a blessing. So we went ahead and got 42 because they loaded some extra ones. I said, no, oh, and she gave us the two extra ones for free, but I wanted 40 because when we move into the other sanctuary, they're going to be the chairs in the back because these are the nice ones. You come early, you get the really padded chairs. <laughs> Our worship team sits on those right now, but they will be in the other sanctuary, and that will give us a lot more seating, so praise the Lord. But when we read the Bible, the phrase last days, we hear that, we read that, 
Our minds tend to gravitate to God's judgment poured out on humanity just prior to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that this is proper to consider, but we also need to take into consideration that last days also includes the time between Christ's ascension into heaven and leading up to the day, to this day, and even up to that day of the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That would be more accurate, okay? There are several things stated in the Bible that have this same language to them, and I would like to borrow a phrase coined by the late Michael Heiser. He said, yes, but not yet. Some of y'all understand what I'm talking about there. Yes, but not yet. We see things that have happened in the Bible and things that happen again and again and again. That's what we would call cyclical. They happen over and over and over again. There's only been one time when Jesus came in the form of a baby, and there will only be one time that he comes in the second coming to reign with a rod of iron. Amen? So we'll get that straight, praise God. But there are times that Christ has shown up on this earth in a burning bush when he talked to Moses. There's been many times that we've seen that. Amen? Some things, things in the Bible are going to be cyclical. In Joel 2.28, you can turn there if you would like. In Joel 2.28, it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. How many of y'all have visions from time to time? You young folks? You getting some visions from the Lord? How about the older folks? I'm kind of getting close to that class, but not really, because I'm still a young man. I still got 120 years to hit. Hallelujah. I love dreams when the Lord gives me dreams and then he confirms them and shows them. We're here because the Lord gave me a dream about Rudoso. And I never even heard about Rudoso. And in the dream, the Lord showed me this place. And I woke up from it and I'm like, what in the world is that all about? I was trying to think, did Sandy fix me some spaghetti or, or what was going on? I mean, what was my thought in that, in that dream? But in that dream, the Lord showed me people that I would meet at this place that I was going. It was amazing when I finally found Ruidosa. And I found out in Ruidosa that a lot of Texans already knew about this place, and I was just kind of left out on a back burner, and I'd never heard about it before. And I started telling people, like, have you ever been to Ruidosa? Oh, yeah, we go there all the time. I'm like, why don't you tell me about this place? I love it there, man. It's incredible. We finally got here, though, praise the Lord. But I started meeting people that I had already met in my dream. Hearing their voices, I knew their voices, I knew their mannerisms, I knew their face. And it was incredible. But we would not be here, I don't believe, because God, for me, has to make it plain and clear. Because I get distracted sometimes. And I've asked, I asked the Lord one time, I said, why, why do you give me these dreams sometimes? He says, because I don't want you to miss what I'm doing in your life. Well, well, praise God. Well, that's pretty cool. So, how many of y'all have dreams from time to time? And you see them come to pass. God speaks to us in our dreams. God speaks to us also in visions. But there's one thing that you need to know that you know that you know that he speaks to you through his word. And everything that you believe is coming from the Lord, you better line it up with the word of God. Don't line it up with anything else. Line it up with the pages that he's given us. we got 66 books that the Lord has given us in the Bible. Uh, you know, in the beginning it was, thou shalt not. Now we got 66 books, right? <laughs> Incredible. But line it up with the Word of God, amen? In Acts 2.17, we have the same verse, which is repeating Joel. Acts 2.17 and it says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my, of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old, your old men shall dream dreams. Praise the Lord. Same scripture. They were just quoting the Old Testament is what they were doing. The Hebrew scriptures is what they were doing. We need both. We need the New Testament and we need the Old Testament. They dovetail together. They complement because they're the same word. They're the word that has been from the very beginning, even before the foundation of the world. It's eternal. God's word is eternal. Do you all believe that? Yes. It has been before this world was even created, praise God. 
God is holding nothing back for the current church age. I don't believe that he's holding back and saying, well, just, you know, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit and everything that you need to be effective in ministry and ministering to others. He's not holding back anything for us, folks. He's given us everything that we need. If we seek him, we shall find him. God is waiting to pour out his spirit, but many are not even desiring God. Many are not even desiring God and the Holy Spirit. Many want his blessings but are not willing to change their minds in repentance. Now, here you go again, Pastor, talking about that word repentance. Yes, we talk about it a lot here because repentance is a daily thing for us in the walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we've all learned a lot of junk, haven't we, in the past. We learn a lot of junk just day to day from just being out and, you know, associating with people. We hear things, we're like, what? What in the world, you know? And that's why we put on the wall what... God says about us, the I am statements, it talks about the significance, the acceptance, and the security that we have in Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you right now, if you don't understand that you are significant, that you are accepted, and that you are secure in the Lord Jesus Christ, then your life is going to be a life of up and down. It's going to be a roller coaster from one emotion to the next because emotions come out of what we are thinking about, what we are dwelling on. Remember I talked a few Sundays ago about the stronghold busting. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is a fortress. It's, for, it's fortified with some things that are just really hard to get into. And what happens is we get strongholds in the mind. Wrong thinking is what it is. If it's not in accordance to the Word of God, then we don't need to be thinking about it. We don't need to be thinking on it. We need to get our minds renewed and get them washed clean. Because the, our, our spirit, has our spirit been made alive unto Christ? You know what that means? That means that you can hear because you've got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. How many of you are saved this morning? Know that you are that if you were to die tomorrow, that you're going to wake up in heaven. Amen. How many of you? Man, all the hands should be going up, praise God. And Caleb, we're going to baptize you and dunk you. Your daddy said three times. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> praise the Lord. Only one time. You may want to go. They're not going to want to get out of that water. I'm going to tell you right now. It's It's nice. We warmed it up really, really nice. And I'm trying with the wood-burning stove to heat up the building in there so we can all get out. You won't want to jump back in so we can, you know, praise the Lord. God is waiting to pour out His Spirit, but many are not even desiring God nor desiring the Holy Spirit. Many want His blessings, but are not willing to change their minds in repentance. Listen, the cross, Jesus was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, was He not? So, blessings, many people, I've heard people say, man, these blessings, they're not contingent. You just get them. No, they are. You get salvation by faith, but if you want the Lord to bless you, then you need to be obedient. It's like my kids. I got 10 kids. Last time we checked, it was 10 kids, right, honey? Yeah. yeah. Six. Yeah. No, well, no, we're, now. we got 11 now. How did that happen? One of my boys got married, praise God. Six boys, four girls. Three of them are in, te four are in Texas with the girl. The rest are up here. Seven. So, But I like to make things simple. So let me tell you this. With the years of training up our children in the way they should go, there's been some moments, especially since we've had ten of them, that they just they weren't perfect. And sometimes to this day, they're not perfect. They're pastor's kids, but they ain't perfect, right? When I was a kid, I was expected to be perfect. And you know what that got me into? Perfectionism. I had to get free of that, praise God. But when my children would do things wrong, if we had an event planned and we wanted to go and do something, until that one child repented, they were not able to go and do that. A lot of times we would wait even because we wanted all of our family to be involved. So the blessings of my children, do, do they have those blessings? You betcha. They're there. I am so willing to pour out those blessings and give those blessings to them. But if I have one that's being disobedient, there'll be a little withholding there. Does that make sense? Is that how you raise your children? Oh, you're being bad? Let's go down to McDonald's and let me get you some chicken McNuggets and some french fries and would you like a little milkshake with that too? What am I doing? 
I'm instilling that rebellion in them. I'm encouraging them. So there's things that have to be withheld. Why are you smiling so ear to ear, Ben? He lost his french fries lately? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Ben. Does that make sense? Yes. So God's blessings, they are conditional. Salvation by faith is, by faith, you don't have to do anything to get salvation other than believe. Many of us struggle our whole lives trying to do things in order to be able to receive of the Father in that regard. When he says, just believe that I love you, that you're significant, accepted, and secure. And if you would believe those three things and all these other statements that the Word of God says, then you would just be resting in the Lord. And what happens with that is sin becomes less and less and less. We're not perfect. One of our things that we say here at New Life is, I'm not a sinner. Now, I may sin, but I'm not defining, and I'm not uh, uh, defining myself as a sinner, but I'm what Paul said when he addressed the church, all the churches. He said, saints. If you get a hold of just that little nugget right there, that you are a saint, and you're not a sinner because you're not in the kingdom of darkness anymore. How many of you were translated in the kingdom of light when you got saved? You are now saints who sometimes sin. Some of us sin throughout the day several times <laughs> and have to repent. Praise the Lord. But repentance is part of it. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to do what? To forgive us of our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm so glad He put that scripture in there. Because there's times that I fall, I get mad, I get upset, and I sin. But God's made a provision for me in order to restore me. Does that make sense? He didn't go anywhere. He's still my father. He still loves me. He still loves you. But he can't bless disobedience. Got it? Obedience, he honors that. He honors obedience. Thank you, Jesus. So God is not holding back. Too many are concerned about status, what they have and what others have, and what they don't have. What somebody else has, I think I want that. How many iPhones are we on now? How many? 14. 14, wow. 15. 15. That's crazy. But many people got to have that next latest technology, the, the update, got to have a one-up on somebody else. I got the latest. People will even go and they'll camp out at the store, the Apple store, before they open. I've heard, I've heard about these things. It's like, are you kidding me? I get mine cheaper later on. Praise the Lord. I'll get it cheaper after somebody else has had it for a while and maybe refurbished or whatever. And I don't need that new thing. I can care less about it. Amen. But many are seeking for things and are concerned about status, what they have and what others have and what they don't have. I would ask you this morning, what are you seeking for? What are you as a believer, what are you as a child of the Most High God seeking for? Jesus. The truth. His way. We have a tendency in humanity, number one, uh, all of us struggle with patience, I'm sure. Many people say, oh, don't pray for patience. You're going to have to really go through the, the grinder on that one, you know. The Word does say let patience have a perfect work. But if we would just let the process start happening, the end result is incredible. So what are you seeking for? Don't get the cart in front of the horse. You can turn to Luke chapter 12. And I'm only going to read verses 31 through 32. Luke 12, 31 through 32. And it says, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God. And all these things... What things? 
Well, if we backed up, it's all the things that the Gentiles are seeking for. But there's even more that's going to be added to you. He says, all these things shall be added unto you. So I'm not against nice things. Don't, get, don't hear what I'm not saying this morning. Okay? Don't hear what I'm not saying. Actually, we can't have nice things. Nice things. Well, we need to just go down and get a... That's the guy in uh, Tennessee, Dave, uh, does the, the financial classes. Oh, Dave Ramsey. Yeah, Dave Ramsey. Have you all been through his courses before? I love Dave Ramsey. He's good. He showed us how to get out of debt. Got out of debt, debt quick. Man, it was incredible. Then I got back into debt. I said, oh, will you take that class again? So <laughs> practice what I was taught, praise God, you know? But Dave says you can have nice things. But don't have the nice things before you can afford them, right? That's getting the cart in front of the horse. All the things that the Gentiles seek after, if you would just get the kingdom, have a kingdom mind first, then everything you need is going to be added unto you. If you need a new truck, praise the Lord, you're going to get one. You need a new house, whatever. You're going to get it. But we tend to go after those things and it gets us sidetracked when the Lord says, if you would just focus on me and the mission that I've given you and be obedient to me, I'll bless you. How many of y'all experienced that? How many of you experienced getting the cart in front of the horse and then, you know, it's not that God doesn't want to bless you. He wants to bless you. But many times we step out of course and what happens is something that is intended as a blessing from God, it ends up being something that really becomes a burden. I was going to use a stronger word, curse, <laughs> because a burden is a curse. And the timing wasn't right. Man, I've, I've been there. I've done it. But you know what? There's this little scripture that I quoted a little while ago, 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So even when we step out, it does not give you permission to have grace abound even more, though. Okay? Well, we got that scripture. We can just go ahead and do it. We know it's not right. And we'll just ask for forgiveness later. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. But when you realize that you have stepped out of course, step back and say, Father, forgive us. Show us how to fix this. And it's amazing in our life, mine and Sandy's life, when we have done that and we truly repent and confess and ask the Lord to forgive us, and man, it's amazing how he just comes in and does what Romans 8, 28 says. For he works all things for the good and the love him and are called according to his purpose. You know? I think about David when he was going out to Goliath, man. It says he hasted, man. He ran out there. He went into battle immediately. He didn't waste any time other than get, to get the stones for the sling. And he met with him. And I've always thought over the years that he had so much faith, he probably he could have tripped three or four times and fell over and rolled and still slung that stone and probably hit him because his faith level in obedience to God was incredible. So the blessings the Lord had on him were phenomenal. He was victorious, amen. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. And then it goes on and it says, fear not. What gets you in a place of getting out of course? Fear. Fear that I won't get it. Fear actually gets you in a place of overeating too. Did you know that? Because you, you think I may not be able to get that again. I've started doing something years ago. Sandy and I started, she started doing it and I started doing it. And now we do something different. But we used to go to restaurants and we would eat. I noticed she would cut hers in half before she would eat and ask for a box right when we started eating. And I'm like, what are you doing? She says, I'm sitting over there because I know I want to eat it all. <laughs> this has got a bill later. And that bill was like half price because you got two bills for one. That's kind of cool. So I started doing that. But what we do now is when we go out, we usually order one meal because maybe it's portions out there. Some serious portions from some of these places. We just ordered one typically, except for on our anniversary. We did get different stuff. You got chicken marsala or whatever it's called, that Italian dish. It was good. 
and I got chicken fried steak. I was hungry. I pretty much fasted that morning. So, hallelujah. But don't get out of course. God wants to bless you. One of my things I love to pray and speak over myself, and I say, Father, I thank you that I'm at the right place at the right time, doing, saying, thinking the right things, meeting the right people. And I always like to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm on time for every divine appointment. Whatever you've got for me for today, I'm there. Here I am. Use me. And a lot of times, I'm very spontaneous, am I? I mean, yeah. Very spontaneous. I may have something planned out, and the Lord has something else planned out. And I'm like, that's okay. We're going to go do this. A lot of times, we'll have somebody we need to minister to, and we just <laughs> clear the schedule. It's okay. Let's sit down. Let's minister. Because that's about eternal stuff. And seeking the kingdom of God is about eternal things. Can we take any of this with us? No. no. It's comfortable to have some nice things, though. That's all right. How many of you need a Learjet? <clears throat> Man, I don't need one, but it'd be nice. Not have to drive 11 hours to the farm back in Texas, but I don't need one. So I ain't going to get one. So... I'm not a native claimant pastor. Some of you all have already learned that, praise the Lord. A lot of people say, that's mine. I claim it the name of Jesus, but it already belongs to somebody else. I don't believe that. If I need something, I pray the Father just send it to me in Jesus' name. And he's faithful and he does. If it's something I really need. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let me move on. He says, for it is Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So when you come under the rulership of Jesus Christ... What you have just done is you've come underneath his authority and you've come underneath his provision. It's now his responsibility to take care of you. A king takes care of those in his kingdom. There's been some really bad kings that have ruled in our past histories in different countries and things like that. Some evil ones. We look at Israel and we, we see all the kings. It was not God's intention to, to give them a king except for Jesus. And they wanted a king like all the other heathen. And he even warned them. The prophet said, you don't want this. You don't. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. You don't want this. Oh, I do. You don't want it. Okay, here you go. Going to enslave your children. Going to take your lands. Don't get out of course. God's perfect will is what we want. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Many are waiting for God to move, but God, I'm going to tell you right this morning, He has already moved. Many think that they need to do something to manipulate God to do something for them. You see that cross? It's a beautiful cross. A friend of mine gave me that cross. There's only two of them that were made like that. I have one, and Jolene McCord has the other one, the part of forgiveness. He gave me that cross. His name's Ray Lang, a wonderful friend of mine in Kerrville, Texas. I love looking at that cross. It's got the turquoise in it. It's just it's very beautiful. The cross is not supposed to be something beautiful, but what Christ did at the cross and through his obedience, it is a beautiful thing to Christianity. It's our symbol that we use to say that we're Christians. A lot of people wear weird occultic crosses, I like just your standard, straight-up, wood-looking cross. But what Jesus did at that cross for us was incredible. His obedience, our obedience now, is what's needed to fall suit in order for him to bless us. But his provision, I've known people in the past that live in a state of poverty I don't believe in that. I don't think that we're supposed to live under bridges and cardboard boxes. There's a disconnect. There's something that they don't understand. They may have some psychological issues too, but they love Jesus. But there's been a disconnect. We need to get a connection to what the Word of God says in order for us to be able to walk in the freedom. What does Galatians 5 1 say? I'll paraphrase it. It says, it is for freedom that Christ hath set you free. Free from what? Free from the devil. Free from sin. 
free from burdens. His yoke is what? Easy. And his burden, is, is his burden heavy? Is it grievous? No, it's light. Amen? He's done everything because when he went to the cross, that made a way for you and me. It opened it up for us. Now we have a highway of holiness unto our Lord. Amen? He sent Jesus, and Jesus was obedient even unto the cross. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It isn't grievous to serve God. Many people think, man, well, when I serve God, i got to quit doing this, quit doing that. And I gotta, you know what? If you just love on him and let him love on you, those things will just, they won't even be really important anymore. I've heard people say, no, I don't want to submit to the Lord because I'm afraid I might have to go to Africa. Sleep in a hut, lay on a dirt floor, and have somebody chew my food for me. Dude, I wouldn't want to do that either. I'm glad you called me up here, praise God. God knows you. He knew you even before the foundation of this world. He has a plan for each and every one of you. Amen? Y'all believe that? Are you fulfilling that? Some of us may be fulfilling it to a degree, but God's got so much more for us. He wants to continue to bless. Amen? I love blessing my kids. I love just blessing them and doing things for them. That's my heart. So even more, my Father, which is in heaven, He's able to do more than I can do. Amen? And wants to do more than I can do even. My blessings for them actually flow from him. Because I can't, I can't love that lady and I can't love those children unless I'm receiving the love of the Father. I can't love them right unless I understand the love the Father God has for me. And then I disseminate that same love to them. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Some of these things I didn't think I was going to be talking about this morning, but I am. So, praise God. So many are waiting for God to move. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It isn't grievous to serve God. If it is burdensome, then you're not resting in him. But you are trying to earn something you can't earn. You can't earn salvation. There's no way. It's impossible. One man did it for you and for me. For the whole world. God is not willing that any should perish, but all come unto repentance and save the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But there are those that are dying every day and going to hell, unfortunately. That is a sad thing. But that's not God's will. And we know that according to Scripture. Amen. It is grievous for the Holy Spirit when we entertain sin. We did a teaching on the three things that we do to the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's been several months back. There's the grieving of the Holy Spirit, quenching of the Holy Spirit and blasting the Holy Spirit. It brought some incredible insights. It was a good teaching. But we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Ghost, and He will pour out His Spirit upon you. How many of you believe that? That if we don't grieve Him, and here in our services, we'll, we try not to do things to quench the Holy Spirit. I tell you all, when we come into worship, come in with an attitude of expectation, an attitude of giving unto Him, of just saying, Lord, here I am. We had uh, uh, one of the guys who used to come to our men's fellowship on Fridays. <clears throat> His name was Caleb. It's been a few years ago. He said, we need to leave, just leave all the stuff out there before we come in here. And I'm like, yeah, we do. Man. And we even made a little sign. It says, what does it say? It says, earthly, Earth, drama. earthly drama stops here. Some of y'all may have seen that on the door. That's because of Caleb. <laughs> I think, Glenda, you made the sign. Yeah, he just put it on there. Man, just leave it out. Because when you come in, we have a tendency to bring stuff in with us, don't we? We got, man, everybody's got baggage. I get that. But when you come in here, just say, Lord, I'm making a concerted effort to just come in here, love on you, let the body of Christ love on me, I'm going to love on them. And I tell you, if you do that every Sunday, then the Holy Spirit is readily available and wanting to minister to you. And so that thing you've left outside, he'll even go deeper and help you deal with that. 
Because you're doing what? You're seeking his kingdom first. You're putting him as a priority. Does that make sense? Amen? We have, the Holy Spirit is so sweet during worship time. You know, we're up here as a worship team, and we're trying to, I know for me, I'm trying to keep chords and stuff. I haven't played on the worship team in a while. And I'm back on for a little bit. But I'm trying to focus on chords, but I'm trying to worship too. Sometimes I'm like, man, I just, <laughs> and y'all see me in the past, sometimes I just stop playing. Especially when everybody else is playing, you know, I can do that. And I just, I just want to worship you, Lord. And I've enjoyed some time off. Being able to just be out there, that's been awesome, just worshiping God. But I love worshiping God. How many of you love worshiping Him? How many of you love the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit? Thank you, Lord. Grieve not the Holy Ghost and pour out His Spirit upon you. There are things that will hinder God pouring out His Spirit upon you. And these things must be repented of. So when you think about the word repent, a lot of churches today aren't even preaching that word. They don't talk about the blood of Jesus. They don't mention hell. They don't talk about repentance. Those are vital. That's vital to the life of a church to walk in those things and to know and understand the doctrines of Christ. Christ taught it. He taught it. He spoke it. He would always go and teach, and then he would heal or deliver. Who was he delivering? He was delivering believers. He wasn't delivering the world. That's the bread for the children. The Word talks about that. Deliverance is your right as a child of God. So what is deliverance? Deliverance is stopping, stop believing the opposite of what God says about you and me. And telling the devil, shut up. How many of you know that the enemy speaks to you? Man, I've met believers who are like, man, Devil, he can't talk. Well, and, 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 I, and I agree, it's probably not the devil. Probably none of us in here have ever actually entertained or listened to the devil himself. But when I say that, I'm talking about his kingdom. When you hear things like, man, I don't like myself. I can't believe I did that again. When you get into that place of not loving yourself, there's a kingdom that's reinforcing that is what's going on. I love the movie Wizard of Oz. And I love there's one scene in there towards the end when they walk in there's lightning going on. Thunder. There's Noises, all, and they're all just there, just, oh my goodness, you know. They're all shaking. The lion is just like, oh, freaking out, you know. And what does it take? It takes cheddar, I mean, Toto. <laughs> cheddar, are you still with us back there? How many of y'all met Cheddar? Cheddar's so sweet, praise God. It takes Toto going up the little dog. Going over and grabbing that curtain and just you know, pulling that curtain back, and they're all just standing there. And all of a sudden, there's this little guy. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> Don't pay any attention to me. There's nothing going on over here. And he's hitting buttons, pulling levers, turning knobs. And he's even, I think, using his feet, and blowing horns, all, all sorts of crazy stuff. Toto's got it figured out. He's like, this is a sham. You guys are freaking out and in fear about nothing. And they finally realize, they're like, wait a minute. Who's that guy? Who's that little fella? I forget the actor that plays the part, but he's a short guy. He always reminds me of Mickey Rooney. I love Mickey Rooney as an actor. He's incredible. But they're looking, they're like, wait a minute. The word even talks about in Revelation, that the nations will look upon that little guy. <laughs> it talks about Satan, referring to him as a man. In the end, they'll be like, this guy is the one that deceived all the nations? He deceived us? And that's the picture I get when I see that scene in The Wizard of Oz. 
Because that fella was defeated over 2,000 years ago on the cross. And all he's got is some buttons and gadgets and levers of lies to throw at us. That's all it is. And when we believe a lie, then that is a platform that we respond from. So if I believe I'm not loved, well, I respond to situations thinking that I'm not loved. If I believe that I am rejected, and I'm gonna tell you, people will reject, they'll reject you. They will reject you. I've had lots of, I've had rejection on Sunday morning after church. Shake people's hand, you know, that, I, that was just terrible. You just gave the devil all the power, and I'm like, I didn't give him nothing. <laughs> I just exposed him to you, though. And you see the little beady-eyed guy. And he was defeated over 2,000 years ago by what our Jesus did at the cross. Amen. Now it's up to you to get into the Word and according, is it in Ephesians 3, 4? I forget where it's at. No, it's not in 4. But it talks about the mind getting washed by the water of the Word. Because that's where our battle is. It's between these ears. It's the things we believe that are lies and we respond from that. I've noticed just in my life in the past because I felt rejected, I start rejecting other people coming out of pride. Or I immediately expect for somebody to reject me and what happens? If they're listening to the enemy, they reject me. If they're not, they love me. That always threw me for a loop. Why is this person loving me? Well, they're listening to God. <laughs> they're listening to the Holy Spirit. Thank the Lord I got it. Free of that, praise God. Amen. Many go day in and day out just frustrated with their life and what has been dealt to them. Just frustrated. You ever been just around a frustrated person? I can't be around a frustrated person for very long and it starts rubbing off on me. Then you're a big guy. I needed somebody to go with me somewhere, I'd probably take you or your dad. <laughs> Both of you guys are big guys. And I'm not going to have you do this, but if Ben were to stand up on that chair right there, don't do it, and try to pull me up into that chair, he might be able to do it because he's a pretty big, very strong guy. But because of this thing called leverage and gravity, more than likely I'd be able to pull him down off that chair. More than likely. The places and the things and the people we hang out with. I'm going to tell you, folks, you need to start recognizing some of the relationships that you're in. Some of them are toxic. Some of them are not good. We taught, <laughs> it's been a while, but we taught on boundaries a while back. It seemed like we lost half the church, didn't we, honey? <laughs> yeah. I had one guy tell me, he says, until you finish teaching on boundaries, we won't be back. I'm like, oh my goodness, man, really? Boundaries are a good thing. Sheldon? Is that right? Yes. Glad y'all here this morning. Sheldon shared with me that he formed. You okay with me sharing that? I already did. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's that thing, ask forgiveness afterwards. In Arkansas. I love farming. My father in law is a farmer. And I love watching him out there in the fields, farming, running his equipment. <clears throat> Years back, he got him a new Kubota. He had a Case uh, tractor. He still has that. And then he had a John Deere, some of the old, old stuff. I think it was a 3010. I used to just love watching him. Man, maybe I'll do that one day. Well, I never did. <laughs> but I do, have, I do have two tractors. I have a Mahindra and I do have a Kubota. <clears throat> They're up on the mountain. But how would it be... For Sandy's dad, Rocky, some of y'all have met him. He's a happy-go-lucky guy. Always smiling. Always got a nice, kind word to say. I love being around her daddy. And her mom. Good people. 
But how would it be for him to go out and say, I'm going to plow that field? And he's out there plowing. If you were like me, sometimes I squirrel. All of a sudden, run through the fence, knocks the fence over, and starts plowing over in the next field. And they already got their seed planted for the year. They got it done earlier or whatever. And he decides, oh, you know what, I'm done. I'm coming back on my side and just kind of plowed out there a little bit. Do you think the neighbors would be a little upset with him? <laughs> uh, yeah, they would be, especially the neighbors we have. <laughs> Back at the bar. The other good people. Praise the Lord. We actually have gaps. Some of y'all know what gaps are between fences and stuff. And sometimes farmers, they go and they do things for the neighbors and vice versa. It's really neat. But boundaries, fences are there for a reason, are they not? Yes. What are they there for? To keep you on your side and keep them out on their side. <laughs> because sometimes that's best. Her daddy used to tell me, he said, boundaries are good. Fences are good. I said, why is that? He said, he keeps good neighbors. I'm like, praise the Lord. I can use that. That's good. A lot of times people, they look at boundaries because they may not have boundaries for themselves. And immediately, you know, if we start getting a hold of setting up boundaries, they freak out. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. I've always been able to walk over here and do this and do that. Wait a minute. What's the fence you're putting up here? Well, it doesn't mean that you have to stay out all the time, but I need to know when you're coming over here. You just don't have free reign. You know, there was a story about a man that had 100 acres, and there was a squatter. How many of you know what a squatter is? A squatter that lived on one acre, and he'd been there for a long time, but as a result of being there and squatting for so long, and some states allow that. That's weird stuff, man. I go on our mountain and I'm always looking around making sure I don't have any squatters up there. You know, I was like, okay, nobody over there. You know, <laughs> Nobody hidden out over here in these pine trees, you know. But because he had access to that one acre, you know what he did? He ran over all 99 of the other acres, had access to them. Quit letting the enemy have an area that it has access to because he'll have access to all the other 99 acres within your heart. Let that sink in. And with that, some of us need to get some boundaries up with some people. I've known people that will come to us for ministry and, and just, man, just in miserable shape. We get to talking to them and then I start asking about who they hang out with or they start telling me who they're hanging out with and I'm like, why are you doing that? Why are you letting them corrupt you? The old saying, I remember a cousin of mine used to have this koozie, and he didn't drink beer. He had Cokes he would put in there. He liked Coca-Cola, the original formula. And I looked at his koozie one day, and it says, it's hard to soar with the eagles when you fly with the turkeys. <laughs> That's true. Relationships. Where's, where's our first relationship, our first power? Who's it with? Holy Spirit, Jesus. That is a priority. Amen. There are things that will hinder God pouring out His Spirit upon you, and these things must be repented of. You're not helpless. I've had people say, no, I'm just helpless. No, you're not. How many of you had, had, how many of you had a choice this morning to get up, get dressed, and come to new life? Yep. Yep. Was anybody forced? Ben, were you forced? Okay, okay. Glad you came on your own will. Praise God. Ben can take it. I like to pick on Ben. So, hallelujah. Many go day in and day out just frustrated with their life and what has been dealt to them, thinking that they're helpless. You're not helpless. You have a choice. You had a choice to come here this morning. You have a choice to be obedient to the Word of God, don't you? Let's just take a moment. Some people don't like silence. It's okay. I love silence. Got a little baby in the background. Just, I love that. Praise God. Silence. <laughs> Can I lead you in a prayer this morning? We're going to close here in just a moment. You don't need to stand up right now.
because as soon as you stand up, I will have to close. No. <laughs> Can I lead you in a prayer and asking the Holy Spirit to just show you if there's anything in your life that you've entertained, that you've been just kind of nursing along that shouldn't be there, that you need to just turn over to God? You trust me to lead you in a prayer? Say, Father God, Father God, I love you. I know you love me. I know you're concerned about me. And Father, I trust you. Even sometimes I don't trust you, though. Forgive me for that. Father, I ask right now, in the name of Jesus, that you would show me if there's anything that I need to give to you. I'll give it to you, Lord. Just show me. In Jesus' name. Just sit there and close your eyes for a moment. I know Father's faithful. I know he's been talking to some of you even before I had you say that prayer. But I'm trusting if there's something there that the Holy Ghost has already shown you, you're going to have an opportunity. You can do it in your seats here in a minute as the worship team comes forward to give that to the Lord. If you need to make an altar, come down here. If you need somebody to pray with you. We're here to do that for you. But I would encourage you just to give it to God. It may be fear. It may be fear of tomorrow. It may be fear of something that's going on in your life. And you're giving the enemy the strength and the power with that fear. It may be fear of a loved one. Something's a loved one's going on here. I don't know. But God knows and you know. Fear is one of the most crippling things that will grip you. And fear and faith are equal in the spiritual dimension as they both project into the future and they both demand to be fulfilled. I would rather be in faith. I've not always been in faith. There's times that I've feared. I used to be a very fearful man. But God has delivered me of that. And there's times he still needs to deliver me because I mess up from time to time and I listen to the enemy. Would you stand with me, please? I was in here last night just writing down some thoughts to share with you this morning. And I heard a song. I was listening to some worship music. I was actually just laying on the floor down here <laughs> working on my message. I love just being in here. And this is what I heard. It says, I wrote, I wrote it down. I said, are the powers of darkness trembling at what they just heard? Come out of your mouth. Are the powers of darkness trembling at what they just heard coming out of your mouth? Or are they laughing at you because you're speaking their language and not the language of heaven? You speak what you hear. It's what you were imagining that comes out of your mouth. The enemy baits you and you go running after it, even considering all those things and entertaining them. When in fact, it's just a demon that fooled you. And now you're the one that has taken up the offense or whatever it may be. As we get into this worship song, like I said, I'd like to encourage you, whatever the Lord has put on your heart this morning, let it go. Just let it go. Trust Him. I love peace. I love the peace that passes all understanding. And the only way I can get it is, as, is, is when I keep my mind stayed on Him. How do I keep the, my mind stayed on Him? I keep it stayed on the Word of God. 
I think about the Word of God. I speak the Word of God. I take the Word of God in. I digest it. I just, oh, I love the Word of God. Because it's the Word of God that brings life and it brings it more abundantly. I would encourage you this morning to let those things go in the name of Jesus and let the Word permeate you. When the Word says you're loved, you need to imagine a Father God in heaven loving on you. Just take your arms, just wrap them around yourself real quick. Just put them around you. There's something about a hug. There's something about a hug from another person, but there's something about a hug. Imagine yourself, Father God, just taking His arms and wrapping them around you and say, Child, I love you. I love you so much. I am proud of you. I am so glad for the day that you were born. You're a good son or you're a good daughter. Because when he looks down at you, he loves you. That's why he sent Jesus. Amen. As they play, if you want to come down, if you need us to help pray with you or you just want to come down here, or you can pray in your seats. Let's just commit it to the Lord, okay? Just give it to Him in Jesus' name.